Hello students and welcome to Jatan's Academy. This is a grade 5 science class and today we are going to learn about the life cycle of plants. Well the first question that comes to our mind is why do plants reproduce? Well, we all know that living things do not live forever. They will die one day and hence to ensure the continuity and survival of their own kind, all living things reproduce. Similarly, plants also reproduce to ensure the continuity of their own kind. The next question that should come to our mind is, how do plants reproduce? Where most of the plants reproduce through seeds, however, there are some plants that do not reproduce from seeds. They have other ways of reproduction. Such plants are mostly non-flowering. For example, ferns and mosses, potato and ginger, and bryophyllum. Ferns and mosses reproduce from spores. Ferns have spores under their leaves which grow into new plants. Here we can see a picture of a fern with spores under the leaves which when fall into the right conditions will grow into a new plant. Potato and ginger reproduce through buds. Potato and ginger have buds which will grow into new plants under the right conditions. Such type of reproduction is also known as vegetative propagation as these reproduce from their vegetative parts. Here we can see potato and ginger reproducing from buds. Bryophyllum on the other hand reproduces through leaves. Young plants grow on the leaf margins of the bryophyllum plant, which will then grow into new plant. Here we can see an example of tiny small young plants growing on the leaf margins of a bryophyllum. Once these plants develop enough roots, they will fall off from the leaves and grow into new plants. Well, students, what happens to plants that do not reproduce regularly. Well, all living things we understood that reproduce to ensure the survival of their own kind. Hence, living things that cannot ensure the continuity and survival of their own kind become extinct. For example, giant mammoths which lived around 10,000 years ago Dinosaurs which lived around millions of years ago. Plants like Archaeamphora or Silphium and even Woods Cycad have now become extinct. That is, they do not exist on this planet Earth anymore. Let's jump into the stages in the life cycle of a flowering plant. Well, it all starts with a small tiny seed. Most flowering plants reproduce from seeds. A seed will grow up into a seedling. The seedling will then grow into a young plant with the help of energy from sunlight. A young plant will grow on to become an adult plant which will then bear flowers. Flowers will then turn into fruits which in turn will contain seeds and the life cycle continues. Let's see how a seed is produced. A typical seed is made up of three main parts an embryo, seed leaves, and the seed coat. The outer covering of the seed which we see over here is the seed coat. It protects the seed 
from injury and drying out. When we open up the seed, we see inside a tiny small baby plant. That is the embryo. It is an immature plant which will grow into a new plant under the right conditions. Seed leaves inside the seed coat contain a store of nutrients for the new plant that will grow from the embryo. Next is the process called germination. Under the right conditions, the seed will grow into a seedling. This process is known as germination. When we say right conditions, what are these right conditions? The conditions required for a seed to germinate are number one, presence of air, number two, presence of water, and number three, presence of warmth. If any of these conditions is absent, the seed will not be able to germinate. Remember students, it's important to know that a seed does not require light for germination. Let's see how a seed germinates. First, under the right condition with the presence of air, water and warmth, a seed starts germinating. First, the roots appear. Then, the shoot appears. The seed coat falls off and the seed leaves provide nutrition for the young plant to grow. As the first leaves appear, the seed leaves have dried up and they'll fall off. The new leaves start making food with the help of sunlight from the process called photosynthesis and the young plant starts to grow. It will grow on to become an adult plant which will then bear flowers. Flower production. After germination, the young plant grows into an adult plant that bears flowers. Flowers are the reproductive part of a plant. Flowers contain the male and the female reproductive organs of a plant. Let's see a typical flower. A typical flower contains four whorls. The outermost whorl is calyx. It contains the sepals. The next whorl is corolla, which contains the petals. The third whorl is androsium, which contains the stamen, also called the male reproductive part of the flower. And the innermost whorl is gynosium, which contains the carpel, also known as the pistil, which is the female reproductive part of a flower. Let's see the typical parts of a flower. We can see the green sepals underneath the flower. They form the calyx. The colorful petals together form the corolla. The male part, the stamen, is divided into anther and filament, which together form our androsium. The female part contains stigma, style, ovary, which contains ovule and egg. Together is called as pistil or carpal, forms the female part, that's the gynosium. Let's study them one by one. Functions of parts of a flower. Pedicel. It holds the flower upright in the straight position. It's underneath the flower, the thin stalk that holds the flower upright. Next comes the sepals. Its main function is to protect the flower when it is in the bud stage.
Next comes the second whorl of flower, the petals. Petals are beautifully colored and scented parts of a flower and their main function is to attract insects for pollination. Next we come on to the male part of the flower, the stamen. It contains the anther and the filament. Anther further contains the pollen sacs. Stamen is divided into three main parts. The filament, which is the thin stalk that supports the anther. Anther contains the pollen sacs that releases the pollen grains when they are ripe. What are pollen grains? They are powdery substances inside the pollen sac which contain the male reproductive cells. Moving on to the female reproductive part of a flower, the carpel or also known as the pistil. Carpel also consists of three main parts. Stigma, which is the sticky tip at the top which receives the pollen grain. Next comes the style. It is a thin tube that connects the stigma to the ovary. Ovary is the swollen base that protects the ovules which contain the egg cells or the female reproductive cells. Well, different types of flowers exist which contain the male parts and the female parts. However, certain flowers do not contain both. Let's see. A complete flower or a perfect flower. Flowers that have both the male and the female parts, that is the androsium and the gynosium, are known as complete flowers. For example, a hibiscus flower over here, we can see the gynosium which is the stigma, style and ovary, as well as the androsium, which is the filament and anther together in the same flower. Such flower is called as a complete flower. On the other hand, incomplete flowers or imperfect flowers. Some flowers have either just the male part, which is androsium, or the female part, which is gynosium. For example, a maize flower. Here we can see a typical maize flower contains just the gynosium, which is the stigma, style and ovary. On the other hand, the androsium is on a separate flower. Pollination. Pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the male part of a flower, that's the anther, to the female part of the flower, the stigma, of the same species. Let's take an example over here. Let's say a pollen grain is there on the anther, which is then carried away from the anther all the way to the stigma of the flower. Once it reaches the stigma, we say that pollination has occurred. Remember students that this has to occur between the same species of plant. There are different agents of pollination. Pollen grains can be transferred by various agents of pollination like wind, water, animals, birds and insects. For example, let's say an insect visits a flower for nectar. The flower attracts the insects by its colorful petals and sweet scent. While the insect is busy drinking the nectar, some pollen grains get stuck on its legs and wings. When the insect visits another flower, the pollen grains from its wings and legs may get transferred onto the stigma of that flower. If the flower is of the same species, we say pollination has occurred. 
self-pollination. When the pollen grains are transferred from the anther of a flower to the stigma of the same flower or maybe to a stigma of another flower but on the same plant, then this process is known as self-pollination. Let's say for example we have a potted plant with lots of flowers and an agent of pollination like a bee visits a flower. While it's drinking the nectar, the pollen grains have stuck on its legs and wings and it may fly around and maybe come back onto the same flower and transfer the pollen grains on its stigma. Or maybe it flies and sits on another flower on the same plant and transfers the pollen grain to that flower's stigma. Such a transfer is called as self-pollination. Cross-pollination. If the pollen grains are transferred from the anther of a flower to the stigma of another flower on a different plant but of the same species, then we call such pollination as cross-pollination. Let's say we have two different plants of the same species and an agent of pollination visits one of the plant. While it's drinking nectar, it carries the pollen grains with it and when it sits on another flower, it transfers the pollen grains to that stigma. Such a transfer is called as cross-pollination. Next comes fertilization. Fertilization is the fusion of the male reproductive part with the female reproductive part. After fertilization, the male cell and the female cell combine to form a single cell called as the zygote. Let's say this is a typical carpel or the pistil. The ovules inside contain the egg cells. The stigma, which is the sticky tip on top, style the thin tube that connects the stigma to the ovary which contains the ovules and the egg cells, together forming the carpel that's the female part. Let's say a pollen grain lands on the stigma of this flower. Once it lands, it starts developing a pollen tube inside the style all the way to the ovary. Once it reaches the ovary, the pollen grain will then travel through this tube and reach the ovary. Once it reaches, it breaks open the ovary and fuses with the egg cell to combine and form a zygote. Once the zygote is formed, the flower will slowly start turning into a fruit. Once fertilization takes place, the ovule will start developing into a seed and the ovary will start growing into a fruit. Let's see how a flower then turns into a fruit. The egg cell that's a zygote which was formed will further develop into a new plant embryo. The ovule will go on to, into developing into a new seed. An ovary will develop into a fruit. So the flowers will then turn into a fruit. Changes that occur after fertilization. Once fertilization occurs, the flower will shed away its petals and the ovary will start swelling up to become a fruit. Slowly and gradually, the ovary grows and develops into a fruit. Once the fruit is developed, the seed then needs to be dispersed away from the plant so that it can grow into a young plant. Once the fruit is developed, the seed inside needs to be scattered away from the parent plant so that the new plant can grow properly. If the seeds are dispersed close by, then the young plant may grow 
under the parent plant and will compete with it for water, nutrition and sunlight. In such condition, the young plant may not grow well. Hence, it is very essential that the seeds are dispersed away from the parent plant. For example, here we can see a young plant growing right under the parent tree. It will grow in its shade and will not get enough sunlight. In such condition, it may not develop into a proper adult plant. Disposal of seeds is carried out by various agents. Seeds are dispersed away from the parent plant by various agents like the wind, the water, animals, and even by explosive action. Let's see dispersal of seeds by wind. Here we can see Angsana seeds which have a wing-like structure and a maple seed which also have a typical wing-like structure. Seeds dispersed by wind are generally very small and light. Some of the seeds have special wing-like structures that keep the seeds afloat in the air. When the wind blows, they are carried away to distant places. Here we can see a typical dandelion and a lalang seeds. Some seeds like dandelion and lalang have hair-like structures which keep them afloat in the air. Disposal of seeds by water. Here we can see a typical coconut seed getting carried away by water waves. Fruits of most plants that are dispersed by water have a waterproof covering that helps them to float on water and get carried away to distant places. Nipah seeds and pong pong seeds. Some seeds have fibrous husk that trap air and help them float in water. The flow of water then carries them away from the parent plant where they will grow into a new plant. Disposal of seeds by explosive action. Here we can see a typical pea pods exploding and throwing away the seeds far away from the parent plant. Fruits that disperse their seeds by explosive action or splitting usually have pods or capsules. These pods dry up when they are ripe, causing them to crack and split open with a force to throw the seeds away from the parent plant. Here we can see a pea pod exploding and a cucumber plant squirting the seeds out. Some fruits squirt their seeds and disperse them away from the parent plant. Disposal of seeds by animals. Here we can see many animals eating fruits which have edible parts. Plants that have edible fruit with tiny seeds inside are eaten by animals and birds. These tiny seeds are often swallowed and passed out unharmed by the animals away from the parent plant. Some animals have a habit of collecting fruits or seeds and they bury them in the ground far away from the parent plant, so that they can eat them later. These buried seeds are sometimes forgotten and they start germinating in their new location under the right conditions.
Some seals have hooks, spines, or stiff hair that get caught in the fur or feathers of animals. These seeds then fall off at a distance far away from the parent plant and start growing in their new location. Well, students, I hope you have understood the chapter Life Cycle of Plants very well. For more information, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so that you get notification when the new video is uploaded. Thank you.